One of the great things about working with librarians is you give them 10 minutes and they take exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> that was wonderful. I don't know how many times I've been to AMS meetings when I see the moderators jumping up and down and waving. And, <laughs> and, uh, but it didn't happen here. That was so cool. Do we have any questions from the floor to start with? Yes, Anna. I have a question. Um, I think Michelle touched upon this a little bit when she talked about visual curators. Um, but I was wondering, recently it seems that there are more positions announced with the word digital in front of curator or project or humanities, preservation, and so on. So I'm wondering what types or what kind of foundation can a library program provide or a library environment if you're already working in one in order for staff or students to build on either skills they have or new skills so that they can apply for a job in digital curatorship or digital preservation or you know, any one of those digital fields? Well, I, think I, I always recommend that students take as many technology classes as possible. But I think that it's also, you know, there's a lot of movement in the digital humanities now around, it's not just the, the, that we're producing digital products. It's the whole um, way in which we produce digital objects to begin with, or digital media to begin with, a lot of which is really wrapped up in social networking and new ways of scholarship and collaboration. In fact, there was a, um, a presentation this morning in music bibliography, and I studied bibliography. I love it. And I think there's so many exciting studies to be done now about the whole process of creation. So I think that you have to understand the medium, but you have to also understand the conditions under which it's created. And then it's really important to have collaborative skills because it takes, I like to say, it takes a village to support a digital collection from creation to you know, perpetuating it for as long as people need access to it. So the, from an educator, I think there's ways that we can build in all of those components into the program. But I would actually love to hear answers from my colleagues who are, ans who are hiring people in those areas and seeing what kinds of skills you think they need once they're in the workplace. Well, I'm uh, in a strange place, as you know, and recently appointed the head of the Conservation and Preservation Lab as an associate librarian with um, responsibility for digital programs. And he, of course, was a conservator of book person. He'd never had courses in digital programming. But what he had was the portal through which all digital uh, uh, collections had to go, his lab and his office. And he's a very smart man, and he managed actually to become extraordinarily good at this in a very short time. It doesn't help say it helps to get a first job, but uh, you know, my if I if, if I could hire legally this way, it's just get somebody who's really smart because you can learn just about anything if you have somebody who's really really smart. Um, I if I see on a resume that somebody has done, for example, if you're talking about internships, an internship uh, in something that involves technology, that would count for us. But again, we're late adapters, and Anne's uh, criteria are probably different than mine. Well, if you're lucky, you get to grow up with it, of course, you know, in the sense that you get a job where there are digitization projects going on or there's an initiative to bring in digital content and uh, you get to put your hand up and say, I will find the time to volunteer to work on this effort. So, um, you know, taking initiative when you can within your own workforce, even if you don't know what you're doing, put your hand up and say, I'd like to put together a team to work on this, very often you'll find tremendous receptivity if your organization is sort of struggling with how to get things going. And, you know, to Paula's point, it's amazing what you can learn through a self-study group, uh, the MIT Libraries uh, eScience and Data Science Support Initiative got started with a reading group of librarians who were interested in this area got together for lunch on a periodic basis, searched the literature, found interesting articles that looked like they might inform the development of a program like this at MIT, and over time built themselves into a team that now does e-science support. 
they, so they were ready when the National Science Foundation came out with its ruling that said uh, PIs have to have a data management plan. They were poised to be able to help do that. So that, you know, that kind of anticipation and taking initiative to uh, both position yourself within your own organization and learn new things, I, I think is a long way to go. And there, there are also opportunities to volunteer outside your organization. Sometimes your neighborhood or your community archives are trying to get a digital initiative of some kind going, and if you volunteer there, you can get the credentials and maybe somebody else will pay for the training. And so just look for those opportunities and self-start. Uh, I'd like to add that you might want to pick a collection from the col a small part of the collection that you're working from, uh, try to find some funding or resources to get it digitized. I've been involved with the Digital Commonwealth in Massachusetts for many years, mm -hmm. and it's very rare that a small institution does its own digitization. Usually it's outsourced. So in the process of learning how to, uh, you, know, you know, picking your collection and then selecting someone to digitize it and help you with the metadata afterwards, I think will be very educational in learning how to manage that kind of project in the future. Because uh, a big digitization project is not going to be done by the music librarian or the subject specialist. It's going to be done by an army of interns and students and part-time people who scan and type. Um, in Massachusetts, if you're fortunate enough to be here, the Boston Public Library offers some assistance with digitization, and I think that in that process you could ask them a lot of questions and get assistance from them. But actually, at one nice example in our program, because this course has been offered for a long time now, is Digital Libraries, which is offered by Candy Schwartz. So I've been going to the final presentations for that class in the 10 years that I've been at Simmons. And it's remarkable to see how that class has um, evolved. Well, first of all, I recommend almost all of my students to take it because the whole course is managed like a team-based project. So I think that's great experience for being out in the world because you're not working in isolation. And they have to do everything from um, scanning to rights management issues working with, they always do a scrapbook from our archives, so they work with if the person's no longer alive in their family. Um, and then they have to do cost modeling now, too. That's a new aspect that was added a few years ago. And then they do a final presentation, and all of those factors are, are, are um, presented on in the final presentation. And now they've even had either relatives or friends of the people whose scrapbook it was come to the presentation, you know, which gets at working with the community in these kinds of programs. I think that in the digital initiative, you know, it used to be if you were the university archivist and Professor X was retiring, you'd go to their office and box up their stuff and bring it to the library. But now that so much stuff is created digitally, you need to be working with faculty, if that's your community or people in the neighborhood, to think about ways in which those collections can be preserved and um, kept by libraries or archives when it's time to transfer them over. So I you know, advocate people taking those kinds of classes in, in our programs. I think it's important to add, if I can put in two cents here, is many of us came into this digitization business with the notion that what we were doing was we were taking something from one format and we were putting it into another. And yes, we were, but there's a lot more to it than that. In fact, there's an entire discipline that has arisen to deal with theoretical issues about what you do with digital information, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about tying it together through data mining or using GIS coordinates to enrich your data in ways that you never could have done with a print thing. So it's a whole new field. Uh, so I think if you're going to enter into it, yeah, you've got to do it, but you've also got to recognize that there's more to it than just converting one thing to another. Well, and this morning, you know, the speaker spoke to that. I mean, for Sorry, doing I critical... Sorry, this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I mean, for critical additions, there's so much potential now, things that you can't do in print format, but so many things that have to be thought about, and that's where the subject expertise comes in to all of this, because, you know, if you have a music background, you understand what an addition is and what the variants are. More questions? In the back. Gene. Right, I couldn't agree with you more. 
more about the importance of customer service. And I think not just from a library employer's point of view, but from the patron's point of view, um, they're much more likely to overlook deficiencies in the collection and in the facility if the customer service is really good. Do uh, you think this is something we teach in library school? You just learn it on the job, or how do you get to it? The libraries that I see that have the outstanding customer service have a, a sort of an, a culture of customer service. Mm -hmm. They develop it and uh, nurture it. I don't know. I'm, I've been out of library school and haven't been involved with library schools for a long time. So I don't know. Michelle, maybe you can answer that. Well, you know, we certainly hope that it's being picked up in the curriculum. I mean, it... I know that it's in the syllabi. Whether, well, to what extent it's picked up, I don't know. Uh, we do what we can, which is all we can do. But I absolutely agree. I mean, having worked in a number of libraries myself, it's in the DNA in some places, yeah. and it's not in others. And even if we train our students to have some of those <laughs> customer um, skills, customer-based skills, um, that doesn't, and they go into an environment where that's not valued, it's going to be hard for them as a single individual because there's so many points at which, you know, a, a patron comes into a library. I just like to add that um, in the libraries uh, that I've worked in, I've always encouraged people to think of customer service not just as public service, but that uh, the technical service people have customers, and those are the public service people, mm -hmm. and the, the director of finance has customers, and those uh, that's everyone, and people who manage the budget. So it's not just people who might be called frontline people, but it's it's everyone actually, because everyone is someone else's customer, if you want to say that. Or, or patron in some ways. So it's not just the, the people at the very front line. So you're the DNA example. Yes, I guess I am. I'm the one they call pathologically friendly, so I did. <laughs> My children said, Mom, you could be someplace with no one and you would talk to the wall. Hi, wall, how are you? Have you talked to Dar today? How's the window? You know, so there is something, people, some people are more, more comfortable doing that. But certainly, even in technical services, well, where I am, we call our catalogers research librarians because they deal primarily with unique material. But they're very sensitive to the to the um, uh, reference and archivist archival staff because of the displays and you know how soon things get into the catalog. So you know, it's not just the reference librarians or circulation; it's it's, it's everyone, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. I think I would just add to that for research libraries anyway, may, probably not um, libraries that have vast numbers of undergraduate students, you know, 300,000 undergraduate students who stomp in the library every day and have to run a kind of uh, traditional reference desk service for those folks. Um, for many uh, uh, of the level one so-called research universities, Oh, reference desks are going away. Uh, and they're being replaced by what are conventionally known as uh, single service points. And it's, it's understood, uh, I don't want to say it's a failure if somebody walks in with a reference question, um, but if you have a service model that says your subject specialists, your liaisons, are responsible for developing personal relationships with the faculty, and personal re relationship with lab directors and personal relationships with uh, graduate students um, and postdocs, then they ought to be going to the subject specialist for support rather than wandering into the library with a question that no one other than a subject specialist could, could conceivably answer. Um, so the, the fact of the online tools of service um, which are ubiquitous these days. Think about every the next time or the last time you ordered something online and the little thing comes up and says, would you like to chat? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> or, Hi, I see you're having trouble. Or, <laughs> you, know, you could buy this now if you want. <laughs> How about a discount? You know? So our, 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 our community of researchers, students, and faculty are being trained by those expectations. 
And we can use those same kinds of tools to develop relationships and support systems to reach our communities um, in, in a way that makes them engage with us on a more personal level and, and a, sometimes a less confusing level than they get if they just walk in and ask a question of whoever happens to be on duty at the reference desk at that point in time. So um, I, I do believe that the, the practice of librarianship is working hard to try to understand the new tools uh, that are enabled by uh, social networking and, and contemporary ordering systems and to embed those in the way we think about providing service in our organizations. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I know at Northeastern University uh, in our planning for the next uh, three to four years we're looking at um, having a uh, service desk that includes let's say customer service assistance from the IT side of the house because it's clear that in certain buildings you're going to have uh, a range of services, um, whether it's computer labs or printing services, where there's an expectation that the librarian isn't going to be able to answer or the service uh, customer services is to answer all those questions, so you actually have merged service service desks. So I'm just wondering how, you know, because library school, you're not learning necessarily all the technology skills, um, how you cooperate with other people have services, provide that customer support. Anyone want to jump into that one? <laughs> <laughs> it was a library school question. <laughs> I know, I, know and I, I don't even know how to answer that. I mean, I, um, I'm bringing my class to Northeastern uh, soon, actually, for a visit, because I think there's a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, some, you know, our students come with such a variety of backgrounds. We do have students who come in with master's degrees in computer science. So some of them, and we've hired some of them back for some of our own um, research projects we have going on. Um, and then some of them, well, you can't say that they've never touched a computer before. Those days really are over. But um, so I, I think it's collaboration. I always stress in my own teaching collaboration. You're working with a host of people and I think that when you put creative minds together you can find a whole host of ways to address people's needs. I think that you know what you're doing at Northeastern obviously makes perfect sense. Um, at Simmons it's sort of interesting because we're a graduate, a professional graduate program anchored in an undergraduate women's college and if you, for those of you who take the tour of the library, I mean, that reference desk was, you know, poured into the concrete at the same time that, you know, as I go around the country and look at other research libraries, there are no reference desks anymore. But for this community in this place, it makes sense. So I think that if you, I always, every institution I've worked in has been very different. And I think that another thing value that we need to always have as professionals is that you have to really understand the kind of environment you're working in, what the needs are, what the opportunities for collaboration are, um, and, and then you go from there. So I, I know that's a weak answer to your question, but it's the only, <laughs> it's the only yeah, answer well, I can come you know, I, up with. I, I, I think, um, I, forget, I don't have the number in front of me now, but some significant percentage of the questions the um, staff in the MIT libraries get have to do with system problems, not content mm -hmm. problems. But they present as though they're problems with the content. And I think it was Arthur C. Clarke, who's the science fiction writer, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> and, and for many of our older faculty in particular, <laughs> the content that is delivered to them in their desktops is magic, right? They have no idea how it happens. It just appears. They can get it from home. They can get it from their offices. They can get it from a wireless uh, connection in the cafeteria. Uh, and they have no clue how it works, except that they know the library's made it possible 
So when Verizon's system goes down because some backhoe cut through it, it's our problem. <laughs> right, 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 right. So this is where the customer service comes in because it turns out, you know, we used to, in libraries, we used to have full control of the spectrum of tools that we use to manage our, our business. We could say with confidence what happened when journals got checked in and how long it took to get from here to there and when they went to storage and all that other stuff. Now we can say, well, you know, we've got this proxy server and it does this and it connects to that and it goes through that. And if you look at the systems diagrams of the architecture that supports all that, you'd pass out. Right? It's really very <laughs> scary. So uh, the, the customers, so th those angry, um, frightened, often frightened, uh, manifestations of what feels to our our uh, faculty as a that, that we've dropped them somehow we failed in delivering a service to them that they've come to expect one faculty member one time told me that when when chemical abstracts went down he said I'm living in a third world country here <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, my I, <laughs> I just like to add, um, for those of you um, blessed enough, which I am not anymore, of being around 18-year-olds, I've been at a desk and had no idea, and there was no IT person around, and I would just say, okay, who can come? And an 18-year-old would come. <laughs> and, and they would be fine, and then you'd make them show you what they did. I mean, sometimes they would present things, so this is what we're going to do, and an 18-year-old would go, Seriously? Seriously, that's what you're, do you think that's going to work? Or even customer service uh, uh, problems if you go to young people. We have a trustee who really wants cell phones to be used in some part of the library, and she's the only person on the planet. So I talked to my daughter, who's aging out but still useful, and I, just, <laughs> I described this problem. She said, Mama, they take the phone and they put it to their ear and they talk into it. I said, yes, I think they do. She said, no one does that anymore. You're everyone text. So this is a problem Tom will solve. You have a lot of old lame people who are actually talking into their cell phone, and soon they'll be gone. So if you can let your ego go and turn to the 18-year-olds and say, you know, help. You know, and then they kind of like it. They like to be smarter than the grown-ups in, in some ways. So I wish I had those 18-year-olds still. That invites another question that has come to us recently, and that's how much are we training our students, not only in customer service, mm -hmm. but in doing the kinds of things that Paula was just describing, or that Deborah was describing of having them as a technical assistant. Uh, we've heard from some of our student focus groups that actually they'd prefer help from other students sometimes. Sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, peer, peer help. What kind of results have we got on that? I see head shaking, but I don't hear any words. <laughs> There's somebody there. Hi, I didn't expect you to be doing this, but um, I work at St. Anne's Own College in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I'm not working there as a music librarian, but I used to do that here. Um, we just converted our reference room to an information commons, <laughs> and that means that we now have IT staff on hand all the time. So if the printer jams, it's their problem, and it's not ours. But um, it's mostly staffed by students. Um, there's supposed to be a regular person there. Um, I haven't seen one yet, except obviously installing or uninstalling or something. Um, so the students, our students just came back from break, and it was the project was complete. So they're still all learning where they go for questions. So if you're sitting at the reference desk, they'll still come up to you and say, where are the printers? Because <laughs> we just moved them to the other side of the building. <laughs> um, but we still, we are the ones who get the technical questions for research. That's how it's supposed to work. If it's my laptop document won't open, um, my thinking, my program won't print out, whatever other side of the room, go talk to the So that's how it's supposed to work. Um, there are still some bugs to work out. I understood that the first night that we were open after break, um, we had student complaints that the IT students were too busy. <laughs> 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 and, and things like that. But um, 
It'll be interesting to see how it goes. I know UNH has been that way for some time, and so I will project this in the United States. Does that make your question? Well, I, I would say from my aged, vast experience with students, they would rather learn from other students for the most part on those kinds of things. And the, the caveat is that young um, people with technical skills are full of hubris, and they, they, what they don't understand, for example, is how to search the catalog, uh, how to use some kind of databases. They have wonderful skills, so convincing them that they're actually skills that can be used is pretty important. But all the, at the last three places I've been, all the, the help desk people have been students, and, uh, and they're phenomenally good, and they keep track of you. And usually my question is, because they look you up, you know, I'm here and I'm having blah, blah, blah. I said, so have you hit it yet? I said, not yet, but I'm close. You know, and they have a sense of humor, and, um, but they have, to be, they have to be taught customer service in the same way as anyone does. And it... At science schools, it's hard. My son went to Caltech, and the year before he graduated, he said there was a group, there was a, um, you know, like their hobby groups, and there was a group for shy people, and they had to be taken to the faculty club to be taught how to talk while you eat, you know, to have a meal with these kinds of, because it just wasn't a skill they had. They were brilliant in other ways, and so if you can call the, the technical part, but really uh, help them understand that they don't know everything, it's good. Yeah, Marty. Actually, uh, I'm Mark. I'm actually from Harvard. And in my presentation this morning, I talked about the multimedia lab that we have there. And, and we really take a kind of a team approach. I mentioned that we have a large student staff, and we, and we screen them and, and uh, probably work with faculty. But it's a very complicated building, and, and many kinds of things happen. Uh, and, and actually, with, with the conversation with the reference desk, I think, I think it's the same thing. Many, it's, it's more complicated on the team that you can go in there. But there's a real team approach, and students do know a lot, like Paul was saying. Uh, and we actually learn as much from them as they learn, as they learn from us. Uh, and a lot of different kinds of things happen there in a lot of different ways. So it's really kind of a team approach, and everyone realizes that they're, they're teaching each other. And, uh, and it's, it's really just being a team and accepting the fact that we're, we're a team that kind of makes it all work, because otherwise um, it would Yes. Hi, I'm Lisa Zeddinger from Brandeis, and at Brandeis we also have a help desk that is uh, run by, well it's not run by students, but staffed by students, and we have a similar model where we've got, um, well we've got three desks now, and we're trying to move it into a one service, you know, put all the service points together. Um, right now we have, uh, you know, a reference desk, and then we have, you know, tier one and tier two, and so and the help desk is very confusing for everybody. So what we're hoping to do is create a, a one a one desk place where all the service points come together and we can learn from each other. So the students who are working at circulation can learn a little bit about reference, we can learn about circulation, we can learn from the help desk students because we're not together, so we're not learning from each other. And um, a lot of the time, you know, we'll get the wrong information I feel like I set the conversation headed in the wrong direction by talking about students, so I'm going to steer it back a little bit to careers again. And I want to go back to something Michelle said in her talk, which, first of all, I was very pleased to be in the top 15% of something. Um, <laughs> but she mentioned the notion of many younger librarians may find themselves on a somewhat speeded up career path. Could you elaborate a little bit on more about how that preparation might go? Well, I, th I, I, you know, as I was saying, when I started in the profession, uh, libraries were exceedingly hierarchical, and you moved up slowly and gradually. One of the things I started noticing first in public libraries, actually, not in academic libraries. When I was in California, they have a public library system and a county library system. And they have county branches in the cities, so it's very confusing. And our students were going into libraries and becoming managers, like within a, a year after they graduated. So they had to run the entire library by themselves. So I think that we try to um, really inculcate values of leadership um, with, while they were in the program. And we had, um, they, every student had to do a portfolio, and they had to come up with 
um, and they found this so difficult to do. They had to come up with a professional plan as the last part of their portfolio for where they would spend the first 10 years of their career and how they would be refreshing themselves professionally. So uh, it's very important to get people thinking about that from the moment they come into the program so that leadership seems more natural. I have to say, I really think there's been a generational shift and a very positive one because, again, I don't know if it, sometime around 1990, a lot of public high schools started requiring service learning to graduate. And so that meant that they had to take the lead, even as high schoolers, uh, to engage with people and organize, organize projects. And that is so different from the generation that I grew up in, where all the emphasis was on you know, grades and high test scores and maybe a couple of extracurricular activities just to give yourself some legitimacy for college admissions committees. But it certainly wasn't in going out and organizing activities. So I actually find this generation of students in library schools is ready, willing, and able. And I think that it, we'll really see that change out in the profession. Um, so instead of this long trajectory, it's going to be very short. Um, I think that sometimes there's, you know, there's generational issues that exist in any institution. I know when I was a young professional, I thought that I was, you know, going to take over the world. And I think my colleagues did too, and we thought everything was old-fashioned, and I'm sure people to a certain extent do that. But I think that 10 years from now, many of the people in this age group that I identified will, in fact, have, have retired. And it's going to be um, the libraries and archives and other information institutions are going to be the, in the hands of a younger generation. If you, I just gave you a couple of statistics, but if you look more carefully at the ALA statistics and see where the age distributions are, it's going to be really different in 10 years. It's going to be people in their 20s and 30s predominantly which is radically different from, from what it is now. You know, we've been an aging profession for quite a long time for a variety of reasons, one of which was this was a career for career changers. So people were entering the field a lot later. So, um, so I think that's part of it. And I, again, I've been for a long time a proponent of engagement when you're in a program. You know, it's not just about what happens in the classroom. In fact, to the great annoyance of some of my faculty colleagues, I like to say, the most important thing you're going to do is not in the classroom while you're here. It's going to be through your networking and the student activities and the internships and shadowing librarians and, and all of these other kinds of activities. Those are the things that are really going to prepare you for being out in the field every bit as much as what you learn in the classroom. I wanted to jump in about networking. I think that that's a real uh, key to career success is knowing librarians who are working in the field that you're interested in and know other librarians in the field that you're working with. And those of you who are here are already networking, the students, the uh, library staff members. But this whole notion of jumping up the career ladder very quickly is happening frequently in Massachusetts public libraries. Mm -hmm. um, and what some people don't realize is that a lot of what a library director does that is the most challenging doesn't really happen when the library is open. It happens mm -hmm. at town meetings. It happens mm -hmm. in their board meetings. It happens when they're turning off the burglar alarm on Saturday morning at 3 a.m. And I think that if you want to move up a career ladder very quickly like that, that networking is really important. It's not only important for finding your first job, and I can attest that I've had six jobs in my 32-year career so far, and four of them I knew somebody either on the search committee or the searcher. Uh, it happens that way. People know people, hire people that they know. Um, but to learn about a management position that you're interested in, I would suggest talking to somebody in the know because it's not always what it looks like from the outside. I mean, in some ways, the students of ours in the Western Mass program are more privileged that way because there are so many more institutions that have one or two people or are open part time. And we had a student who within the first year of her job in a public library, they had um, a flood, 
um, mold breakout, and then the tornado, which devastated almost the entire town. And she had to, and again, she was the director, almost fresh out of our program. She had to manage a whole community, really, around the library. Mm-hmm. And so we, we featured an article about her. Um, we have this info link, and sometimes the stories get picked up by other news outlets, and this is one that did, but it was fascinating. I mean, obviously, we can't teach them all of that in our, our program. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we could. Other questions out there? Well, I have one, then, if there's not one immediately. This is from my canned list. Oh, there's one. No, Sorry. there was a hand in the back yeah, there. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm Damien Eisman. I work for the New England Conservatory. I wanted to go back to something that was said earlier about how it's magic for family <laughs> members for the food. Well, but what I find is that it can't, increasingly, it can't be magic for us mm-hmm. under the hood because those days are over. I mean, when I went to library school in the early 2000s, like was said earlier, a lot of career changers, a lot of people in their mid-40s saying, I'm tired of teaching, I'm going to do library stuff because it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, we can't, I don't think we can have those attitudes anymore. I think increasingly we have to, and it seems like a lot, maybe Simmons is doing this as well, is that we need to increasingly know what is going on under the hood um, about the technical side of things. And we can't throw our hands up and say, Hey, I'm a librarian. You know, I don't, I don't deal with that. But, you know, IT deals with that. I don't know about a proxy server. What? I don't know. And I don't think we can do that anymore because it's doing a disservice. Because people associate technologies with the library. They don't say, "Oh, that's something different from the library." They see it as it is the library. So um, there was a question there, but, um, <laughs> but the question is uh, maybe what, what is Simmons doing to? Uh, address that situation as sort of like the technical side of the computer side of things? Well, we do have a technology uh, requirement in the core. Um, But, you know, they're going to work in a variety of environments. And uh, obviously, if they go to MIT, they're not going to have the the level um, of technological savvy as people on staff at MIT are going to have. But they may well have it when they're in the Hudson, Massachusetts Public Library. So um, I, there's just so many environments that they go into. I think the best thing we can do is prepare them to be ready for any of those environments and to, to do what they can in whatever environment they, they work in. I just think that one of the things about technology that we have to remember that's so different from librarianship in the past is that it's incredibly volatile and dynamic. Mm-hmm. So if if you got your degree from Simmons in June of this year and they taught you everything you needed to know, your, your information is going to be out of date 12 yeah. months from now. So there's a lot of personal responsibility associated with staying up to speed in technology. Um, you know, for some reason or other, I, I uh, a couple of years ago went back to look at the state of technology when I graduated from Simmons. And it was IBM mainframes. <laughs> IBM mainframe, mainframes. That was it. And in the following 10 years came um, uh, mini computers, microprocessors, um, ARPANET, Internet, Telnet, uh, Ethernet, uh, uh, acoustic couplers that would link you to technology that enabled mm-hmm. online transactions. I mean, in the, in, the, in, in the period of a very short, and, you know, culminating Turn-key in my own systems. personal IBM PC in 1982. You know, it was very <laughs> exciting. But a, a lot of the... A lot of the learning happened uh, on a day-to-day basis because of a a personal level of effort and commitment to stay up with that technology. So um, I I think you can't, this is not the kind of environment where you can expect Simmons to teach you everything you need to know. Well, and I'm not sure you were implying. I know that, I know that, I know that wasn't the question, but. Well, I agree with that sentiment, but then I think that libraries need to be doing more about providing opportunities for continuing education experience. Because you cannot expect individual right. libraries on their own to be able to afford 
all the continuing education <coughs> they can, that they need. They do up to so much, but at some point the institution can act. Absolutely. And actually, um, I, I should put in a big plug for our CE program. Because I, I guess we have this, or I have this cradle to grave socialist approach to <laughs> the world, Scandinavian socialist approach to the world. And so, what, you know, we want to help people throughout their entire careers. And we do have a lot of courses. We, we do it on a cost recovery basis, so they're inexpensive. And we give discounts to our alums. And we do have technology courses, and it is online. And we just launched yesterday our first free webinar. So when we can afford to do free webinars, we'll do that. Um, so I do think we have a responsibility to our students after they graduate from the program. I mean, we're the only program in Massachusetts. We're the largest program in New England. And we have a responsibility to the entire profession here. Um, so, you know, we will try to do that in as much as we can. I do worry about the trend, though. I, I shouldn't say trend. It's come out of economic necessity that a lot of places have cut back on their uh, support of, of uh, staff who can go to conferences and take continuing education courses, and that's, that's a little bit of a worry. But I, I do think that there has to be a personal commitment to make a little bit of an investment in that as well. Yeah, I think most most organizations try very hard to keep staff up to yeah. speed in the enterprise systems that they run in their environments. But if if you want to know more than that, then in your annual performance appraisal, you have to say these are the kinds of trainings I would like to get next year. You have to think about the sorts of things you want to learn to do better in your job or to do a different kind of a job, um, add to your portfolio. Uh, and, and use the tools uh, of communication and planning that are available to you to, to keep up to date. I think we should also remember something Michelle said in her talk about investing in yourself, yeah. which is just as important as your institution investing in you, because if your institution isn't investing in you, maybe you should invest in yourself and go to another institution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at Western University in Connecticut. Um, the last question made me think of a situation that's coming up in some academic institutions, I think not in all public libraries, but um, a situation where libraries are merging with IT organizations. And I'm wondering if there are ways that we can prepare students or prepare ourselves once we're already in the workforce for a situation like that where we might be in a structure that's very different than, than a librarian's mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my experience, it goes both ways. Yeah, it's like the same thing. Jim uh, <laughs> and, right. And, right. Yeah, it goes both ways. Sometimes the library, which has a reputation for providing service and listening to the community, gets the IT department because people hold their heads and say, oh. Um, and sometimes the IT department gets the libraries because people think the libraries aren't investing in contemporary technology. So, you know, it can go either way. Um, and it can be successful or not, <laughs> either way. Right? So uh, the, I think the best thing to do is to suss out those situations where um, it has been successful, whichever way it goes, and find your colleagues and talk to them and see what worked and what didn't. I think it was Michelle who said every, every library, or maybe it was Paula, every library has its own culture, and that's really true, and every institution has its own culture too. So you have to adapt to the individual culture. I think libraries are starting to get responsibility for a lot of things. Yeah. They're getting responsibility for academic <coughs> computing and the learning management systems that run on campuses. They're getting responsibility for the academic presses in their organizations. They're getting responsibility for academic media production, uh, you know, audio and video and and support for distance education in those ways. So uh, libraries have a reputation for being uh, customer-oriented and uh, capable of moving and good financial managers. So, And they know everything, typically, that's going on across the organization. So when there's a broad organizational issue that needs improved management, it is very often the library that 
that pops up as an organization that should take this on? Well, I'd like to add, and it kind of speaks to what Damien said, too. I have an institution that until two months ago had one IT person, and uh, he's very good and kind of does it out of pro bono. I think he could make five times as much someplace else. But because of that, our reference librarians and other and circulation librarians had to become the IT experts. And the best person in the building is somebody who works in membership who has to talk uh, our members through online registration, online renewal. And, and this is a generation that seriously think the computer is going to blow up if they hit the wrong key. They are waiting for the explosion, but because the, the void that, that that staff had and, and having people who, they don't think of it as IT and then the rest of us. They think of it as yeah. Andy and the rest of us and everyone's doing the same thing. So part of it's attitudinal if you can just think of them, you know, they're us too, so. Uh, John Mentor, welcome to the Peace Foundation, I live in Boston. Um, I was talking with a few people at MIE down in Dallas a few weeks ago. There was mixed opinions as to how, as to whether online courses somehow were less um, authoritative maybe than face-to-face -face courses or and somehow they didn't have the same kind of impact when a resume is in front of someone. I wonder what the panel's kind of opinions were on that. If, if courses are going increasingly more online, uh, um, you know, is that a change in attitude in terms of potential employers or is there something that online courses have to do to combat that kind of opinion? Well, God, this is something I think about a lot because it's really pervaded our profession. I think there's a whole spectrum of useless courses to superb courses. And it certainly makes possible collaboration with people from around the world and the use of faculty from around the world. If it weren't for the WISE Consortium, my student couldn't take the music cataloging course this summer unless she went to Milwaukee. Which, and found a place to live and signed up for the course. So it certainly provides new opportunities. Um, we now require that anyone teaching an online course has to take a course on pedagogy. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think in the online environment, you have to teach even better because you don't have the face-to-face -face interaction. But in fact, um, some of the faculty and our adjuncts go through this course too. Some of the people who've gone through it have said we should all go through it because it's such a great boot camp in a sense, you know, for really good pedagogy. So it's certainly, it's very important for our profession because we're teeny tiny. There are 59 accredited programs in all of the United States and Canada. It's not like, you know, if you want to go to business school, there's 2,500 of them. So people in our profession can live in the parts of the country that have no school for three states, yeah. right? If you're in Idaho, for example. So it's, this is the only opportunity people who cannot afford to pick up and move far away to go to a program have. And I think that's really what propelled it to begin with. And then some of the programs that have more muscle um, and I think of Illinois as being the primo example. They invested a tremendous amount of money 15 years ago to start their LEAP program, have been able to take advantage of the technology in amazing ways. The people in the LEAP program um, participate in the regular graduation ceremony in real time that they have at Illinois. So I think that you know, a really good use of both you know, of hybrid, face-to-face, -face, online can uh, create some exciting programs. Um, but it's not going to go away. Again, our profession is too small for us to only be about face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I would add we've been up to our ears in online education at MIT over the last several months. And um, so I, I actually happen to know what the, what the actual costs are of doing a, a really good online education. It's about a half a million dollars a course. Because the course needs to be completely redone to take advantage of and to work around the liabilities of an online education. So I actually think that what's going to happen in the years ahead is that um, we'll, we'll see MOOCs emerge, which is massive online open courses emerging as the, <clears throat> the sort of state of the art of online teaching and that uh, a portfolio of those things will develop and
people will blend those kinds of high-end, extremely well-done courses um, into local campus profiles of course offerings. So, you know, if you want to take differential equations, why don't you take it from somebody at Stanford? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's being right. able to tap into that expertise. Right. And in fact, the UK with the Open University was very pioneering in, in all of this. But as I did say, uh, most of us don't have those kinds of resources to pump into it. So we've waited a very long time at Simmons because the technology is different now. And we can do, with web-based uh, tools, we can do things we couldn't have done 10 or 15 years ago. Well, from the hiring perspective, one of the recent people we hired is our second systems person, and she had an undergraduate degree in computer science and decided she wanted to become a, a, a library systems person, and she lived in Kentucky. So while working full-time, she went to library school online. And, I mean, that shows a lot of spunk, and it also was the only way she could have done that because she was supporting herself while she went to library school. So I think maybe not for major universities, but certainly for places like mine. And, and But she didn't need an MLS. That wasn't the point. But, you know, I think the people's circumstances are people's circumstances, and sometimes you just have to understand what they are. I wanted to add that I mentioned that we do a few hundred training events a year for librarians in Massachusetts, and we're just starting to dip our foot into electronic training, and it's a lot of work to, to put together even for informal sessions to make them effective and interactive is, is very challenging. But I've always wondered the same question that you are, and I mentioned my wife is a career counselor, and I asked her, how do people react to that? She said, usually they don't even know. People just put their degree on their resume, and it doesn't say virtual or not virtual. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to the online learning thing. I, I'm Allison Estelle. I work upstairs full-time in the library, but I'm also a distance student, and I'm actually taking one of these mythical lives consortium classes right now. <laughs> um, and to, as to uh, maintain the anonymity of people involved, I'll just say I am intensely interested in the topic. The professor is clearly a subject matter expert. And it is one of the most frustrating things I have ever done in my whole life. And it's not about I crave personal communication with people and getting together. We have a discussion board. People respond. There's great, great discussions that happen. Threads, wonderful. First of all, if, it's a totally different form of pedagogy. I mean, if you, if you're not detail oriented, um, if you're not technologically savvy as the professor, you can create glitches unknowingly that cause so much stress, and you're out of, commu you can't, out of communication with the people for over an entire long weekend that you don't have access to what you need to, and then the assignment we do at 8 a.m. or whatever it is. I've lived through it. I'm still shaking. But, uh, <laughs> that, but also, I think there's a really strong. It's the, the program seems to be using a form of, of their own branding of like a blackboard learning system. And I think that even though there's a lot to be said, there's final papers, there's a lot of other alternatives, but there's also weekly quizzes and this kind of a quantitative analysis of our work. True, false. I mean, it doesn't really get at the nuances and shades of the topic that you really. Should, if you don't provide a full fact pattern, you can't really choose the truth. Are true or false. If you don't look and see that they've updated and yes, this answer is now true. Last year it was false, but this year it's now true and you don't update your system. Um, I love this class and yet I, I, I find it incredibly frustrating and, and the, the point about it, it's a whole new form of pedagogy. It should not be entered into lately because it's, I mean, it's, I mean, Simmons is paying for it. Thank you very much. But um, <laughs> I'm for this class and I really, you know, I mean, it's, I think there's a lot of great things about it and I feel like I'm making colleagues you know, virtually in a really great way. And I do feel mentored by my professor in some ways, but... Uh... Well, I would posit that that can happen in the real classroom. I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's limited to uh, online uh, instruction that it doesn't seem pedagogically sound. I went to library school in 1972, and one of my classes was library hand, seriously. Oh. <laughs> learning how to write library hand. And I, I would suggest that uh, in terms of frustration, your experience was uh, kind of, yeah, low on the spectrum. So I'm, <laughs> I mean, I think my point is, yes, they're going to be bad teachers online, but trust me, there are really bad teachers in the classroom who have tenure. I've had odd, I don't understand. Seriously, at Simmons, everything has been so amazing in the classroom in terms of the way people integrate technology in the classroom. That's great. Very lucky. 
You should give lots of money to your uh, <laughs> alumni association. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> but I've been in the academy most of my life, and it, is, it can be discouraging. But, but it's good, you know, because um, we don't allow students to take all of the WISE courses. So I would say um, I think it's good to give Terry feedback because we only, you know, know what we hear. Yep. No. I guess the only option. Obviously, there aren't, you know, for some subject areas, there aren't other opportunities for some of these courses. <laughs> I see by the clock we have about two minutes before our next event, so I think we could end by thanking all of our panelists for a wonderful job.